Good evening and thank you all for joining our annual Henry Rothschild Memorial Lecture at the Shipley Art Gallery Gateshead, though not at the Shipley Art Gallery Gateshead this year. My name is Janine Barker and I've worked with the Shipley and specifically the Henry Rothschild Collection for over a number of years. And we are so pleased to be able to offer this talk online this year and that so many are in attendance. Current numbers have 139, which is amazing. And thank you to all the team at the Shipley and the Tyne and Weir Archive and Museums for adapting and making this year's event possible, along with many of the other online events we've held. So a particular thanks to Ben Jones, who has coordinated this evening's talk, and who right now is making sure it all goes smoothly behind the scenes. Please note that the event will be recorded to share online, but be assured that the recording will feature the main speakers only. So for that reason, we ask that you all keep your video off and your mics muted, but you'll still be able to see myself and Sandy and the other speakers. So not only will we be hearing from Sandy Brown, we also welcome at the end of the talk, Liz Rothschild, Henry's daughter, to tell us about the Henry Rothschild bursary winner and announce this year's recipient. For those who've attended our previous lectures, you'll be aware of Liz's keen involvement in the Rothschild collection and the bursary. And we thank her and Northumbria University for their continued support to the craft community in what are particularly uncertain times. So before we begin, I'd like to invite Julie Mill, who's recorded a short video for us. She's the Chief Curator of Art Galleries, to say a few words. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julie Mill, Chief Curator of Art Galleries, Tiny Ware Archives and Museums. Welcome to the 10th Annual Henry Rothschild Memorial Lecture at the Shipley Art Gallery in Gateshead. For the first time, I'm holding this lecture online, which is exciting and poignant in equal measure, but great that we've been able to adapt to present circumstances and renew the lecture here at the Shipley. I'm actually pre-recording this from the Shipley as we thought it'd be nice for you to get a glimpse at least of this beautiful gallery in Gateshead. The Shipley holds one of the country's finest collections of 20th century studio pottery in the Henry Rothschild Study Centre for 20th century ceramics as part of the Shipley's nationally renowned collection of contemporary craft, which also includes textiles, metalwork, furniture and jewellery. This renowned collection received a boost two years ago with another major gift of ceramics from John Christian's Studio Ceramics Collection by the Arts Council Acceptance and Move Tax Scheme. The Henry Rothschild Study Centre offers students and visitors the opportunity to explore the major movements of British studio ceramics during the 20th century, alongside ceramics from European potters. Henry Rothschild was an important figure for craftspeople, offering them his encouragement and support. He worked hard to promote the best partners when others had yet to take notice. In 1946, he opened Primavera in London. It became the country's leading craft retailer and later another Primavera was opened in Cambridge. The shop stocked furniture, textiles and glass, but mostly ceramics. It became a showcase for new and diverse work and from 1953 delivered an ambitious and exciting exhibition program. We are delighted that we're able to work with Liz Rothschild, Henry's daughter and her family, and also with Northumbria University on this lecture series and on the Associate Bursary Program, which supports ceramic artists. The new bursary holder, who was only selected last week, will be announced by Liz at the end of the lecture, and I'm so excited to be able to find out who it is. I'd like to thank both Liz and Northumbria University for their support, without whom this program would not have been possible. Professor Dean Hughes, Deputy Faculty Pro Vice Chancellor, Department of Arts at Northumbria, along with Sim Hannes, our curator of Sainsbury Centre for British Art in Norwich, Ronald Pyle, ceramic restorer and previous manager of Primavera, and Helen Walsh, curator of ceramics at York Museum Trust. I'd like to thank them for selecting, along with Ben Jones, art participation officer from the Shipley, who will select the new bursary ceramicist. My grateful thanks goes to all of them. I'd also like to thank the Tiny Archives and Museum's Art Gallery's team, with colleagues from Northumbria who have organised this event, including Rachel Hooker, our communications officer, and Kate Gunnasekera, our, our administrator, who support the selection process for the bursary. Also to Janine Barker this evening, who was chairing the event, the subject of whose collaborative PhD from Northumbria University, who is in partnership with the Shipley, is the Rothschild Collection. Every year we 
work to identify an outstanding ceramicist to deliver the Henry Rothschild Memorial Lecture. And I'm absolutely delighted that this year it's Sandy Brown. We will talk about her work and I thank Sandy in advance for agreeing to do this lecture. I'm now really pleased to hand over to Janine Barker, who will introduce Sandy and her work. Thank you very much and enjoy the evening. So thank you to Julie and again all the team who, at the Shipley and Tram at Large who are working incredibly hard to ensure the continuation of our region's culture. I'm very pleased to have been asked to host this year's talk with Sandy Brown, a ceramicist of great depth and talent. I first became aware of her work as I started working with the Rothschild Collection in 2011. There are two pieces in the collection and they stand out for their colour and their form. I was lucky enough to interview Sandy as part of my research and she helped me to inform my own ideas around what is craft, what is art and what lies between. Following Sandy's talk, we will take questions, but in order to help the event move smoothly, please submit those questions using the chat function on Zoom and we will try and get through as many of those as possible. We do ask that everyone can keep their videos and their mics muted during the event, please. So to begin, please welcome Sandy Brown. Thank you, Sandy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I, I must say, it's a tremendous honour to be invited to do this talk. Um, I was very fond of Henry Rothschild. He was um, a great character and a really passionate about ceramics. And I was very pleased to have been able to invite him to the studio um, several times and to get to know him. So um, I'm delighted to be able to um, be part of this. Right, the first, uh, first image shows um, I was uh, a lost teenager. I didn't know what to do. So basically I left England in this Volkswagen camper van with a couple of other ne'er-do-wells. And we set off to drive across Europe and Asia. This photograph is taken in Afghanistan. And um, I ended up um, in Japan. So uh, uh, to, to cut a long story short, um, I ended up in Japan. And one of the things that you do when you are, oh no, not, not yet, thank you. One of the things when you do when you arrive in Japan is that you start being fed and eating and drinking. And I, I, this was my introduction to ceramics. I knew nothing about pottery. I didn't even know it existed. And when I was in Japan, I was being um, wined and dined and entertained um, by friends, people that I would meet uh, and in restaurants. And this is how food is presented. Uh, I mean, this is a beautiful meal. And so look at the ceramics that they're using. Uh, there's a very close relationship between um, chefs and potters in Japan. And so I gradually came, became drawn into this new uh, medium to me. And so, yeah, so now we could go to the next image, Ben. Um, Can you move on, Ben? Okay. Thank you. And so I moved out to Mashiko. I was taken to Mashiko by some friends. Mashiko is a village of about, oh, I don't know, maybe over a thousand potters all in one place because that's where the clay is. And I worked in this pottery um, called the Daise Gama. I was there for three and a half years. And this dish is the one that I like the most um, because the way, they, the way they glaze this dish is uh, a it's the creamy colored glaze is made from the rice husk ash and they 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 glaze it by throwing the glaze through the air the white glaze is thrown through the air with a ladle and they catch it with the dish and so that's how it gets the pattern and i just love the freedom and the slight madness of that and the way they they glaze the the dishes so that's the, in a way it's that spirit that i brought back um, from Japan with me. So now we can, next one, uh, Ben. Yes, and so, and I, I work with a Japanese kick wheel. Um, this is now my studio in England. Um, yeah, it was on the cover of the American Ceramics magazine, which I was quite pleased with. Um, it's the, this is my Japanese kick. I think actually currently, I seem to be the only person in the UK who actually uses one of these wheels. It's the most sensitive wheel to use. It allows one to, to make pots which are fresh and sensual and have some sort of life in them because the wheel turns slowly and they can be um they can look sort of irregular and a bit sort of asymmetrical which is the whole point really because they're handmade so yeah so that's how i um that's how i work yeah thank you next one uh, 
Ah, yes. Yeah, so there we have a tea bowl, a tea bowl made um, on, on the kick wheel. And I was gradually, you know, developing my language of color. Uh, it was one of the reasons why, um, one of the reasons why I got to know Henry Rothschild actually, because he was very attracted to the color because when I first met him, nobody else was using color um, um, in British ceramics. In fact, there was almost a bit of a thing that one shouldn't really. And so um, um, I did very well because I, um, I started using color um, and you know, what a lovely palette it is really using natural oxides, manganese oxide, copper oxide, cobalt oxide. Yeah, thank you, next one. And yeah, so that was, that was a, a plate. So I started making plates for um, dining. These are um, dinner plates, I still make them. I, I use them in my home every day, so do many other people. And each one is painted differently. Each one is effectively a painting. I sort of gradually developed my language of being able to make a composition really without planning too much actually. It happens sort of organically. So yeah, next one. And uh, a tureen, a soup tureen. Um, uh, yeah, so I was making pots that we can use every day. And you know, one of the things that um, I uh, really benefited from seeing in Japan is that pots that are used every day can be works of art and they can each one be different and they can be highly valued and still used. Um, and so I was so pleased to have had that introduction. And so that's what, that's what I do now. So yeah, that's a Turin. Yeah, on the cover of Ceramic Review. So thank you. Next one, please. Yeah, and a lasagna dish. And I have the, this lasagna dish actually got me a lot of attention because as a result of seeing um, one like this, the Crafts Council um, invited me to go to America as a new emerging um, potter. So as part of the, uh, um, an exhibition they were having in, 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 in the USA, uh, presenting new British artists. So I was very pleased to be part of that. And it was the lasagna dish that they liked. And you can cook lasagna and it can go in the oven it's one, these are some of the strongest, most robust functional ceramics you can come across actually. Uh, so yeah, next one, please. And then that is a serving platter. Love that rich red. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, next one. And yes, so uh, this um, um, was a way of, of photographing the, the dishes, showing them how they can be used. Um, yes, in my home. And do you find that very important, Sandy, on the fact that your ceramics are usable, functional wear? Well, that's, that's yes, absolutely. Yes, very much so. I, I, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, you know, we buy, we buy, we spend a lot of money on cars and, you know, we're not afraid of driving them, are we? And I think it's the sort of, it's just um, accepting that um, it's, it's okay to use them. They're strong, they're robust, and they're a great pleasure. And then what a, what a difference it makes to our daily lives. You know, that they enhance our daily lives. They enhance uh, eating and dining. Um, somebody was telling me how, somebody was saying with me yesterday, how during lockdown, that's right, he wasn't in his normal home and he missed, he didn't miss the people so much. He missed his things, the objects, that he uses every day. They're so important, aren't they? The yeah. objects that we use every day, our favorite mug, our favorite plate, the dishes, they're so Something important. Something very comforting. Yes, comforting, aren't they? They're, they're, they do become like family. And so, yeah, why not? <laughs> why not use them? Definitely, yeah. Next one, thank you. Yeah, so that one was also on the cover of Ceramic Review. Thank you, yeah. Next one. And then um, I, was, uh, um, I was encouraged by a collector who came to the studio to start making larger forms. And uh, he saw a small piece and he said, oh, that'll look great two meters tall. So uh, he asked me to make it for him. So I did. And so this was the first um, sculptural piece that I made. It was, it was great fun to be asked to do something uh, different. You know, and I do love using the cobalt blue. You know, I've got this sort of vocabulary of, of color and language that um, 
um, somebody has, you know, uh, people tell me that my work is quite easily identifiable. And I think it's because of this language that I seem to have developed using the slip trailer and brushes and the colors. So yeah, thank you. Next one. And then I was asked to do um, several of them. This was an installation at um, Rufford in the ruined abbey at Rufford. Um, yeah. Thank um, yeah, next one, thank you. And this is my studio now. Um, yeah, I'm very lucky to have a, a lovely building to work in. Um, and it, um, because it's quite, it's quite spacious, it allowed my work to continue developing. So yeah, next one. Um, it's just down the road from my house. And so, um, yeah, so that was how my sculpt, that's what they, that was one day a few years ago. Well, quite a while ago now. Um, yes. Yes, there's several large pieces on the go there, aren't there? Hmm. Yeah, next one, thank you. Hmm. Yeah. This is before they were fired. Yes, uh, yeah, next one. And, uh, you know, making plates and uh, small pieces and functional wear throughout the whole thing because I, I like doing that. Um, yeah, thank you, next one. Um, yes, so you can see that that one did get fired big donut form. Mm. Thank you. Next one. Yeah. Yes, I seem to be um, focusing a lot on circles and um, at the moment. Yeah, the next one. Um, yes, and uh, um, for a while I was doing figurative work. Um, uh, and uh, they they come from they come from actually they come from playing. I don't plan or organize in advance. They come from doodles really. And then I I I just in fact with this one I just started at the feet and built up. I didn't know what she was going to be like. Um, yeah, next one. Thank you. Uh, this is a clay painting. Um, it's about um, six feet by four feet, um, or two meters by a meter and a half. Um, uh, yes, uh, made, uh, I made it in one piece and then um, uh, had to cut it in sort of jigsaw shapes to fire it and then assembled it afterwards. So it's mounted on a wooden board, this one is. Um, and I, you know, I like the sort of, it's a great um, forum for a lot of painting and being expressive with the slip trailer. The slip trailer, the one that makes the lines, the, the way you have to sort of just sort of squirt color all over the place. That's my favorite tool because you really have to be free to use it. Um, it doesn't work otherwise. And so um, it's just great to just like jump in the deep end and have a go. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Next one. Yeah, a mermaid. I made this one, actually, I made this one um, during a demonstration, I think at, uh, well, one of the British ceramic events um, uh, some, some years ago, and then it, um, it's now in a, in a private collection, or it's in a collection of a sculpture park here. Um, and uh, yeah, it was on the cover of the German magazine too. Um, hmm. I mean, that was demonstrating me not knowing what I'm going to do. That's what I like to demonstrate is what I call my spontaneity performance where I start with a lump of clay and then something happens and that was what happened. I mean, so I made her in about, I don't know, 45 minutes during the demonstration. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, next one, thank you. Yes. That was sculptural form. Yeah, I like her. She looks well, she is female, isn't she? Um, yeah. That's in a private collection. Thank you. Next one. And this was a commission from some lovely people who um, have been collecting quite a lot of my work. And they wanted um, these 
these individual the individual tiles are actually quite large. They're about 16 inches square and um, quite thick too. And, and they wanted them to be um, fixed to the wall and as one big painting. So um, uh, that's what they are. That's what that is. Yeah. Uh, another dinner plate. Wow, look at that. I love that. That cobalt, isn't it? Just fabulous. Yeah, those blues are amazing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Next one. Thank you. Yeah. So this is these are the glazes. That little red one at the front with this the oh, I keep thinking of the Japanese word. It's a spoito in Japanese. The slip trailer in front. Um, that's the one that I that I like using. So I fill that up with colour. Various brushes. There's nothing special about the brushes. The regular household paint paint brushes, different sizes, wide ones, narrow ones, different coloured glazes. This is what the. In fact, this one on the right, the bottom right of the picture, is the probably I think it's the cobalt blue. The cobalt blue and the copper green look grey when they're when they're raw. So um, you know, I really don't know how they're going to how it's all going to work. Um, until after they come out of the kiln. So, yeah, thank you. Next one, please. Yeah, so there's some more slip trailers. I've got a whole collection of slip trailers, one for each colour. <coughs> and then I can just sort of um, play about, really. Yeah. Thank you. Next one. Uh, and then um, uh, about 15 years ago, I was very lucky to get a very generous grant from the Arts Council to develop a new body of work. And I, I did a new body of work called um, The Still Point and the Dance. And The Still Point is a contemporary tea ceremony inspired by the Japanese tea ceremony, which is at the foundation of Japanese culture. It's a choreographed ritual about preparing tea. And uh, so um, the tea ceremony room I made is at the back, that white room with the sliding doors um, and the idea is that you would um, re just refresh clean cleanse your hands with the jug of water and the bowl there and go through the circle pass through the circle to symbolize renewal this is my version of the Japanese tea ceremony it's not at all a Japanese tea ceremony they don't do it like this at all but I was inspired by it and then you go inside the room um, to where um, I would um, serve tea. Thank you, next one. Yeah, so this is inside the tea ceremony room where I had designed the furniture using two different colors of wood. Um, I sewed the uh, seating, the cast iron kettle was thrown on the wheel and then made into um, uh, forged by a cast iron uh, maker. And uh, so you can heat up the kettle and uh, make the tea. And so in, in the Japanese tea ceremony, it's the tea bowl, it's the communal object. Um, and in fact, in my tea ceremony, I did use a teapot. Um, yeah, because the communal object in Japan is cleansed between each guest. Um, uh, so I had so actually I had several bowls and the teapot was the communal object. Yeah, so thank you. Next one. Yeah, so this is the seating that I sewed. Um, thank you. Next one. And the dance. So the still point in the dance. This is one of the sculptures from the dance called Prelude. Um, yeah, which um, came from a small doodle, actually. And I really liked it. And I thought it was quite profound in some ways. And so uh, made, um, I've made, uh, yeah, made another larger version of it. Yeah, so next one, please. Um, as you can see, I had to involve, um, you know, how to how to make it work as a structure. So um, it's um, it's uh, all these beads going around corners onto a metal um, pole. Uh, yeah, thank you. Next one. And there, there it is um, in. Uh, a private collection in Germany, um, staying outside in all sorts of weathers. Yeah, yeah, it looks great, doesn't it? Really like that one. Mm. Thank you. Next one. 
And the dance, yes. Yeah, so this is another sculpture um, about the dance. This one is also in a private collection. Hmm. Yeah, again, you know, I start, you know, I start at the base, I build up and I don't know quite where I'm going until I, until I see what I've done, really. Um, it's like uh, improvising. Um, I did have a show in, in America uh, some years ago called Visual Jazz, because, you know, in music, we, are, we understand the, the idea of, of improvisation. And, you know, in a way, that's sort of what I'm doing in ceramics, in the form and with the painting. Thank you. Next one. <clears throat> yeah, so you know, that is the sort of way that it looks before it goes in the kiln. It looks very, very different when, you know, before they go in the kiln. Uh, you don't see the colors until, you know, until they've been fired. Yeah, and I, I'll, yes. Your um, health and safety there, Sandy, is uh, <laughs> a little troublesome. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yes, I'm standing on a stool. Yes. <laughs> Got leads on the floor. I think the leads on the floor is because um, I think I was being filmed while I was doing this. So there was, um, yeah. Oh, as long as there was someone else in the room then. Because, <laughs> right, they, yeah, they took the picture. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Next one. Yeah, so uh, so that's the kiln that I have. I, it is a large kiln, large enough. It's about um, uh, oh dear, I have to do it in metrics. It's nearly two meters tall inside. In fact, I think it's over two meters tall inside, um, and so it allows me to make tall sculptures in one piece. And of course, in order to do that, I have to be able to move them from A to B. So um, I have this um, pallet stacker. So they're built on kiln shelves. So I make them on a kiln shelf, the pallet stacker can pick them up very, very gently. It's a wonderful bit of kit and put them down inside the kiln so they can be fired. It's a gas kiln. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, next one. Oh yeah, so this is, um, this is my, in, in that lovely studio building, I've got a big gallery upstairs um, where I've got a sort of continuous Sort of evolving exhibition and that's where this photograph is taken um, again on ceramic review yeah thank you next one and i i paint as well uh, gradually the sort of um, the language of painting has jumped onto canvas so i do large paintings on canvas as well um, using the slip trailers as like the potter's approach to painting really um, Thank you. Next one. And I was asked to do a performance piece. This a lady on the right, I can't believe I'm showing you this actually. <laughs> the lady on the right is a dancer. Uh, she actually um, um, uh, was a dance officer for the Arts Council. She'd always wanted to dance herself. And she approached me and said, suggested we did a, a joint performance piece in which um, we painted each other and pranced about a bit. So. That is actually what we did. So next one, please. Um, using um, color and mud and clay, and we uh, and and the next one, um, please. Next image. Yes, and we did this in the Northcote Theatre in Exeter. We did it as a performance piece with a musician. So it was a lovely conversation between Christopher Graf, who's the musician playing the violin. He was sort of improvising. We were improvising. And it was a great fun sort of bit of nonsense to do. I'd love to do it again, actually, because I, um, I hadn't been, um, I wasn't terribly fit when I did it then. And I, um, I'm a lot fitter now and I've done a lot more dancing. So um, it'd be great to do it again. Um, so yes, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. Next one, please. And this is a commission I got from a lady who wanted a, a complete house full of tableware. And she wanted me just to use mostly the green and a little bit of pink. And, and, and that was not a limiting factor at all. I found that, uh, yeah, so that's one of, one of the, one of the din dinner plates. Um, and, and they're all different, everything is different, but you can see that they're connected and related. Um, and, you know, uh, so she uses them, which is great. Thank you. Next one, please. 
and uh, I was invited to China. I was invited to represent Britain in China to um, make some new work there for a, a new museum that was being opened up. And uh, so I, I um, yeah, and the next one, I'll show you what I made. The, the large, there's a large form in the next image. Um, thank you. Yeah, so that's what that became. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of the museum now. My brain's gone blank. But anyway, that's where it is in China. Um, yes. Okay, next one, please. Pooping, that's right. Oh, Christmas cake. This has got nothing to do with anything, really. But um, why not? Christmas cake. Yes, thank you. <laughs> next one. <laughs> so it gives you an idea of the size of the kiln, really. Um, this is a guy who helps me sometimes. Um, yeah, so I just wanted you to see the inside of the kiln, which we've made ourselves, you know, out of ceramic fiber. <coughs> thank you. Next one. Uh, yes, yeah, so there we go. The show in America, visual jazz. With the lovely Lucy Lacoste in the gallery in Concord. Um, yeah, next one, please. Oh, haven't we seen that? Have I got that one in twice? I can't believe it. Uh, we saw that one already, didn't we? Sorry. <laughs> next one. Yeah, and well, there's another big square platter. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fun just to play, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, you know, so the thing I do when I start something like this and I've got something like this in front of me in my hand, I empty my mind. I don't plan. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I just start and then something happens. Next one. And this is a, a, another big painting, a commission um, by some lovely uh, big um, collectors uh, who um, have been great um, supporters of my work. Um, so this is uh, another very large tiles as one as one big painting. Yeah. So next image, please. And these are all stoneware. So I worked to stoneware. So they're five to about twelve sixty, twelve seventy. Um, and this one, well, this one, because the tiles are quite big, I did, we did lose quite a lot of them in the making. Um, and, uh, and even so, even so, um, um, I still did not want to plan what I was going to paint until I painted it. And I had to give myself permission to fail. I had to tell myself, even if it doesn't work, even although it's taken months to make these tiles, if it doesn't work, I'll just make some more and it'll be fine. So I have to give myself permission to fail when I let go. If I'm tense, if I'm anxious, if I think it's got to work, then, um, then you know, it might not actually. What makes it work is the fact that, that I'm that I'm not attached to the outcome, that actually whatever happens is going to be okay. Um, and then something extraordinary happens. Yeah, so yeah, there's a big, uh, nice big black vessel. Yeah, I like that one. Black clay with porcelain slip over the top. Thank you. Next one. Yeah, a bird bath. Again, that's a commission. Thank you. Next one, uh, another tile painting, um, a commission. Yeah, next one, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, one of my tools that I like um, combining different colors of clay, this is one of the things I've been doing is combining um, China uh, porcelain and that's a, that red clay fires black behind it and then texturing it with a, actually it's a, a, a butter mallet that something like my grandmother had when she was making butter. Um, yeah, next one, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the black clay with the um, porcelain, oh, it's three layers of different colored clay there, playing with the, the colors of the clay, as well as the colors of the glazes. That's a, effectively a sort of standing painting form Thank you. Next one. Yeah, and that's the other side of it. So it's, uh, 
Yeah. Thank you. Next one. Yeah. So here we are in the studio again, making a large um, pot form. Yeah. Thank you. Next one. And uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I had a big, I've had several exhibitions in Germany. Well, many exhibitions in Germany, actually, um, um, with a gallery, Marianne Heller, who is, you know, one of the one of the best ceramics galleries in the in Europe, and I've been showing with her regularly. And so this is a show that I had there with her. This is outside her gallery, and um, um, so my work is in many European museums as well. Um, so yeah, thank you. Next one. And yes, so this is an, another commission. Yeah, why didn't you make a large teapot, they said. So, okay, I did. So I made a large teapot. I remember to measure it so that it would go into the kiln. That's something I'm not terribly good at, actually. Um, but I did remember to measure it. So it was, it's the size of the kiln. And then I added the figure on top as a bit of nonsense. And uh, so she liked to dance there. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> okay, next one. Yeah, that's, yeah, another black clay painting. Yeah, thank you. Next one. Oh, that's a painting on canvas again. Yeah, thank you. Next one. Yeah. Thank you, next one. Oh yes, I've been asked to paint a boat. This is how I keep fit by going rowing. And they asked me to paint the boat uh, because we were going to a big championship event in Holland. And so I, I painted the boat, then I had to paint the clothing and then I had to paint the oars as well. This is called pilot gig rowing. Thank you, next image. Um, yeah. <laughs> next one, thank you. Yes. And uh, yeah, so I started painting clothing as well. I did that as part of the, <laughs> I do that sometimes. Um, and so, yeah, these sculptures, the three totems. Mm, yes. Thank you. Next one. Uh, these are the three graces. Again, it was a commission um, from these lovely collectors. Um, Really nice. They're, they're about two meters tall, these forms. Mm, thank you. Next one. And then I was um, invited by Sotheby's to participate in the big exhibition, 20th Century Ceramics at Chatsworth. And so I decided I would make a temple. And this is how the temple began. This is, it came out of a doodle. I just sort of said I would make a temple, had no idea how to do it. So I made a small version. And then we worked out how to scale it up. So then the next one is, um, yeah, so making a, a wooden, um, that's the roof, the domed roof for it in my, in my gallery, in the upstairs in the studio building. Yeah, next one. Um, so, and then we painted the roofing, those are the roofing tiles. I painted each one differently. Um, yeah, next one. And uh, we had to make lots and lots and lots of tiles. So, uh, and then I painted them. And again, I painted them without really planning. I think I'm doing the inside. I think these tiles ended up inside. Um, yeah, and there's all bits of the temple around and about behind me as well. Um, but yes, without, again, without, you know, just planning. Hmm. Um, okay, next one. Yeah, so that's um, one of the one of the painted tiles. Um, next one, and then uh, this is the painting the floor of the temple. So I had to lay it on the floor. This, it gives you an idea. It's four meters square. So we made all the tiles. I laid it on the floor of the studio, and then you know I had to set about painting it without. Again, this is cobalt blue being brushed. So I had to put um, a long. Um, broom handle on the end of one of my brushes and because uh, I couldn't I couldn't reach the middle um, uh, otherwise and so that was the way of um, getting around that so again you know without planning too much 
if I just sort of relax, if I just relax and let go, it works. So thank you, next one. And uh, this is how it looked when it's installed at Chatsworth. So there's stepping stones, three arches, four columns around it, finials on the top. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, there we go, a temple. Yeah, thank you, next one. Yeah, yeah, it's the thing I'm, I'm very, I'm most proud of really actually. Um, it's a non-denominational space for contemplation and reflection, spiritual sort of um, non-denominational space for re spiritual reflection. Yeah, next one, thank you. Mm. Yeah, next one, thank you. And inside, this is how it is inside. So there are two cube seats and um, yeah, again, we made all, made all the tiles and then I painted them. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Thank you. Next one. And this is inside the temple looking up into the dome. Um, um, and so you can see the, um, the colored glass um, um, yeah, so it was, it was at Chatsworth for about um, a year, more than a year. It was, it kept being extended by popular request because it was in a show with Henry Moore. It was in a show, the 20th century sculpture in the landscape with Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth and, and uh, Damien Hurst and Sandy Brown, people like that. So, um, yeah, thank you. Next one. You. Yeah, so it was on the cover of Ceramic Review again. Yeah, thank you. Next one. And then uh, then it was shown uh, at Messams. The temple is available, actually. It's still available, I will just say that. This is Messams, a show I had at Messams, which is a gallery in, in Wiltshire, a lovely new gallery, um, where I, I exhibited a modern banquet. Um, and it, the whole lot was bought by an American um, film director in Los Angeles. So um, that was great. Uh, thank you, next one. And some thrones, um, again, a commission from some lovely collectors. Um, so yeah, they are, they are outside in the snow and weather, aren't they? You, they can contemplate their, their, their estate, which I think they do. Mm. Thank you. I'm very, getting very good at making large square slabs and large um, sort of tiley things and joining them together. Yeah, next one. And this was um, um, the, the last show I had in Germany, I think two years ago, three years ago. So these were large pieces to go outside the gallery. Mm. But I think the photograph is taken in, in, there um, inside the gallery, but then they ended up outside. Thank you. Next one. And this throne went to the um, Frankfurt Museum of Art and it's in their permanent collection of, uh, yeah, they bought it. Thank you. And then I was, this is a bit of nonsense. Um, this is in the village where I live. Um, they asked, I was asked to paint the Skittle Alley for them. So I did that as a bit of fun. And it was great because the guys who play Skittles really like it. <laughs> uh, yeah thank you next one uh, another painting on canvas yeah next one and this is another commission a tall form that was going to go in fact I think I've got uh, an image um, or you'll see um, yeah that's a tall form again I like doing these cobalt swishes swishes circles and squares seem to crop up quite a lot really um, and I, the flow. <clears throat> yeah, next one. And then it's installed in this pond, in the center of the pond with some tiles. Um, yeah, this is the same lovely couple who also commissioned the thrones and the thrones are quite near there as well. So they can um, sit by the pond in their thrones. Mm. 
Thank you. Next one. And this is a large tile. Um, I am getting very good at making large tiles. This is probably, when I say large, it's about, um, uh, oh, it's nearly, uh, oh, in it's about 30 inches. I don't know what that is in centimeters. I can't think in metric, but it's, um, it's 30 inches square in one piece. And um, yeah, they, they, fire, I, I, they fire quite well. Yeah. Yeah, next one. Another commission. This one actually became a water fountain because the lady who commissioned it suggested that it could be used as a water fountain. So, um, so it can be, so it is. Um, yeah, next one, thank you. Yeah, this is another of the large tiles. They're about probably about um, half an inch thick. It's really about um, even drying, even firing. That's how they work. And I do like this sort of um, work incorporating texture. That's the, the bare clay with the white glaze um, trailed over it. Quite a bit of texture on this one. And I'm, I'm increasingly using that more now. Yeah, next one. And this is a maquette. This is a, another doodle for one that I haven't made full size yet, but I'd, I'd like to. Um, this is one is um, in the, in the um, yeah, in the waiting room, really. <laughs> Be nice if somebody commissioned me to make a large scale version of a sort of a colorful henge. Thank you. Next one. And this, this is a commission. Again, another big clay painting. This one is outside. Um, installed outside um, at the home of these um, collectors. Um, yeah, so lovely, lovely. Uh, and one thing out of the, that came out of the temple was using a lot of turquoises and blues, which I like using that language. Yeah, so next one. Oh, it's a big, large, big platter. Slightly out of focus, isn't it, the photograph? Sorry about that. Large, big platter. Now, somebody was asking me earlier about where I get, I have to admit, I get this red from when I was in China. When I was in China, there are lots of little glaze shops in the in the town in Jingdezhen, where like bakeries, where they the families sort of buy all the glaze materials and make the glazes. And um, and I, I bought, this is what I call my Chinese red, and I bought this red there. And then I, on its own, it's very flat and dull, but actually I mix it with my own glaze to give it some sort of um, glossy uh, quality. And that makes it look uh, more interesting, but it's a lovely rich color, isn't it? It works really well with the manganese and the cobalt blue on the turquoises. So I've got quite a rich palette now of colors. Yeah, next one, thank you. And this is another, uh, another clay painting, um, which has been installed outside. Yeah. Lovely rich blues, aren't they? Thank you. Next one. And this is a maquette. This is a doodle. One, another one that I'd like to make larger. One thing that I notice when I go out rowing in the boat, which I do here because I live by the sea, um, there are lots of floating buoys um, um, in the estuary around, and they are interesting shapes. And this this form um, was inspired by the the floating buoys that I see. Um, they are sort of squares and circles and um, lump you know things on top of each other and uh so i think that's where that came from next one and this is another doodle that one that will will probably get made at some point it's a labyrinth which you can walk in you can walk in um so if i make this one a full if i make a full size version of it you'll be able to walk into the center um yeah next one thank you and these are some um, <coughs> cups and saucers. I'm working on a project for St. Austell at the moment, and they are wanting to celebrate the China clay heritage that they have. And so I thought I would play with the China clay. And to my great surprise, these cups and saucers are just made entirely of St. Austell China clay. Um, it's normally China clay is considered as not being very plastic, not being on its own, but it is beautifully plastic lovely sensual clay to use so um so yeah so i made them and and um yeah they're in an exhibition at the moment next one please and um yeah this is now we're getting up to the current day because i'm working on a big project at the moment of which this is part that i can't say too much about 
other than its four syntostal. Um, and the next image also, um, yeah, um, this is the studio. This is the studio yesterday um, or the day before um, working on this big sculpture for St. Austell, which I can't say too much about other than it will be quite amazing when it is installed. And it's been keeping me going through the lockdown and I've been um, working on it. It's, a, it's called the Crest Commission. St. Austell is doing quite a lot of um, um, encouraging, um, commissioning contemporary art now to celebrate their, their heritage. And so um, I've got this absolutely brilliant challenge to make something which is going to be amazing if I can actually achieve it, which I think I can, because I've, 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 I've got to, a movable gantry in the studio. You can just see a part of that. I've got structural engineers, fabricating engineer involved in it now because it's going to be um, assembled. Yes, so thank you very much indeed. I think that's the last image, isn't it? Yeah, so thank you. Yes, that is. And you are right on time, Sandy. Well done. Oh, that's good. <laughs> good. I wasn't really <laughs> sure. And we've had some wonderful questions coming through. I was trying to group them all up into kind of themes, but I think um, I'll just read through them. As I say, if everyone could kind of keep their mics off just so we don't get a lot of kind of uh, talking over. Um, so yes, yeah, so from Sarah, we have a question about when you first started using your colour glazes, did you have much chemistry knowledge in terms uh, of what you were? Um, no, very little really. I mean, I think um, um, I was very lucky that um, uh, right at the beginning, you know, this was the days when potters had to make your own, you had to make your own glazes. Um, uh, and so I did what all, what all, all, all um, people who work in ceramics do, or, um, is you just start by blending two materials. It was experimenting, trying two materials. You know, I would try, I remember doing some tests with Cornish stone and um, wood ash and just trying, you, know, you try 25% of one, 75% of the other. Then you try 50-50 and then you try 75, 25, do it the other way around. And it just, you just mix up lots and lots of small tests. And that's how I got to understand how colors behave. So it's all trial and error. And actually, once I found something that worked, I stopped testing after that. So I'm yeah. not, you know, I, I, I don't carry on. Well, I am doing a bit of testing now because I'm developing sort of celadons and, uh, and white glazes, but I don't do a huge amount of testing. Once I develop the color, the colors that worked in the early days, then I sort of stayed with it and wanted to develop how I would use, what would I do with these glazes once I discovered it? So for example, with the copper green, I had a base ceramic, a base transparent glaze that I developed and, um, and then added trying, is it gonna be 1% of copper oxide to make the green or is it gonna be 20%? I had to try uh, lots and lots of tests. And then I found the, the, the range that works. In fact, it's 8% that works. And so- um, tip for everybody. <laughs> it. I'll give you that for nothing, yes. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so then I didn't experiment with it anymore. I just didn't want to, yeah. mess, didn't want to mess it up. I want that, okay, you, you just be regular and do your thing and yeah. I'll be the unpredictable one. I can't stand <laughs> being unpredictable as well. No, no. <laughs> Um, there were a lot of questions asked about your large, the larger pieces about about the kiln and how you fired them. Obviously, you showed us that two mm. meter kiln, mm. um, but then you also said something interesting about how often you don't measure as you're building. So, I imagine there are a few instances where you realise it's not going to fit in your. Well, it did. It did. It did happen that uh, only only a couple of months ago, I had to fire a sculpture where it just was too big to go in the kiln. I couldn't quite close the kiln door. So I had to extend the kiln temporarily. Because I'm, luckily I've got lots of ceramic and fiber around the studio all the time. So I had to, about three inches of ceramic fiber strip, and lots of it, I had to put around the door to extend it. Um, but I won't make that mistake again. I can tell no. you. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of thing you do once, isn't it? Um, <laughs> So how did the for those pieces that stand outside, I think everyone can agree that those um, lovely, uh, the images, especially in the snow, are just beautiful. Um, how are they fixed outside? Are they kind of 
concreted in or well the the large ones there on a, some of them it did, uh, some of them are freestanding some of them are fixed to a concrete base some of them have um, if they've got multiple sections, like the one that's um, in the snow, the one that we saw in the snow, that's um, on a metal pole. The metal pole has a round base, which and the round base itself is of the concrete, so it's quite stable. And that's been outside, yeah. and and you know the same with the columns around the temple as well, because the columns and and they were outside all winter at Chatsworth, and they had severe weather, strong winds rain, snow, all sorts. And uh, they were fine, even although they're separate pieces. They're not actually joined together. They just, the ceramic pieces just sit on each other on a metal okay. pole. And, and um, the metal pole is, was bolted to a large, a large base. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of questions asked about kind of your inspiration. Um, you, you say that you're very free in how you work and how you don't particularly plan. Um, some questions about whether you know Hepworth has been an inspiration to you and these kind of where do you get these shapes and colors from well um you know I don't need to look outside myself to find them you know I mean um when they come from when they when I'm playing about or doodling they come from um they come from what I can only describe as the collective unconscious. I mean, Carl Jung wrote about the collective unconscious that we all have within us um, a language of form and shape that, um, that has meaning. And you'll see it in a lot of um, um, the native art, native Indian, Native American art, ancient art. And, um, and somehow I think, you know, I sort of, when I let go absolutely, I think that's where it comes from. I mean, some things have been inspired by external things. I know, for example, the temple, and I didn't know about this until after I had made it well into the making of the temple, that when I was on that journey in my Volkswagen, in the Volkswagen camper van, when we were going through Iran, I was taken into several mosques. Mm -hmm. And the mosques in Iran are uh, full of color, full of color, turquoises and blues. And um, I think that sort of stayed in my brain for yeah. you know, hundreds of years. And it didn't come out until I started making the temple. I didn't even know it was an inspiration until I was well into the making of the temple. Yeah. But when I thought, why am I making this temple? Why does it have to be these colors? Where has that come from? And then I remembered, oh, yes, that temple in those temples in Iran, particularly one in a place, a city called Isfahan, which has got a huge, great um, turquoise blue temple. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we went to the Taj Mahal in India. And, you know, that, although that's not color, but it is a, an incredibly sort of evocative form that mm -hmm. looks, sort of looks familiar, even if you've never seen it before. You look at it and you think, I know this form. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's where. Um, yeah. So I don't I think need to go and see it. I don't actually need to go and see anybody else's art to do mine. It just sort of comes. Yeah, and it is very much your own. Um, I think one of the images that you shared of doing that sort of large piece where you've got the the brush on the broom handle and um, someone, uh, Liz has asked a question here about if you like, you like to stay fresh, so how do you know when to stop? Well, it's the when same. Is it, when is enough enough? <laughs> It is, I have to listen to my inner sense. I have to be guided by my body, really. It's about my body is leading. I'm not doing it, for, it's not coming from my head. It's coming from my body. So um, if my arms pick up another color and they use it, then that's fine. And I sort of watch them. I'm watching them the way you'd be watching it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same impulse that says, uh, it doesn't even say it in a word, but that's enough now, stop now. I just, yeah. um, it's the same, it comes from the same place, the same place that tells me to do a big blue swish, swish and some you know, green blobs over here also tells me, okay, that's enough now. Yeah. And is that the same, uh, we've got a question from Maria saying, how do you know when it works and when it doesn't? Is that the same? Do you have a feeling for a piece if you're working on something and you go, this isn't, this isn't what I'm feeling? Um, it, 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 what I have noticed is that it always seems to work if I am in that right place of 
letting go of having it doing it from the empty mind um it doesn't work if i'm tired i have to be sort of um um uh, alert and energized and it's like a moving meditation actually so um if i'm in that place then i think i can probably say actually that it always am i going to say it nearly always works you know i can't think of an example where it hasn't worked actually the, when it doesn't work is if I, for example, um, start trying to make it work. That's when it doesn't work. Yeah. It's so when you sort of interfere with your own process. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, another interesting question, and I think this ties in with your exhibition in America, this visual jazz, is that your work does have a lot of rhythm. Uh, this is from Mella. Um, do you listen to music while you work? I don't actually, no. Um, um... I tend to find it a bit distracting. The only time I have listened to music is actually when I painted that boat and I had Led Zeppelin going on in the background. <laughs> Brilliant. And that worked really well. <laughs> uh, what sort of temperatures do you fire to? Um, uh, just to get these rich colours. Uh, that's from Guy. Uh, well, about 1260, 1270. Um, yeah. yeah, high stoneware temperatures. Yeah. Mm. Um, there's an interesting question here from Jeff and I was thinking of this in relation to the Chatsworth pieces because mm. Chatsworth is quite an unusual place and it has this mix of very traditional art and very contemporary art and that's sort of been pushed forward by the, the family of collected in that way mm. but do you find that you're more popular outside of Britain than in Britain? No. Maybe something to do with your style or do you think that's just how I don't know. I've yes. certainly done very well on the continent of Europe. I've been to Australia several times. If it hadn't been for the lockdown, I would have been in South Africa. I was invited to their, be their national award judge this year. Um, and I've exhibited in America many times, actually. Um, I don't know, because uh, if I think, I don't know, I'll have to have a look and see where my work is, because I've, I've got a list of all the museums worldwide that hold my work in their collection. I think it's about 45. Um, mm. But, you know, there's quite a few like you in the UK and there's, you know, quite a few here that have. So I'm, I'm, I don't think so, actually. I think yeah. I've, I think I've, I've done well here as well, actually. Yeah. I think with your pieces, so like, especially these larger pieces now, it's really about the kind of outside space as well, isn't it? It's like where is going to mm. be able to present them to their best. Um, advantage, which is why Chatsworth is a wonderful place. It is, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Um, a question from Liz Willis is, um, as it's important to you that your work is used, how do you feel about some of these pieces being behind glass in museums as they are at the Shipley? Yeah, no, well, that's fine. It's a different context. No, that's, yeah. that's okay. I yeah. think, I, you know, in museums, I think I, that's fine. I, I think I, I, I always feel a bit sad if, if I think people who... Um, you know, individuals who buy my work and have it in their homes and don't use it. You know, I think in a way they're sort of missing out, really, mm -hmm. because there's there's no reason not to, really. Um, it's like having a car and not driving it. Yeah, yeah, no, I see what you mean. Mm. I think sort of the work that I did on kind of on Henry's collection at the, the Shipley is that there are a lot of those pieces that were used mm. um, in the home. Mm. and then they've kind of they've been transferred by way of that collection which I I think is really important to show mm. um let's see I've got a few more questions it's a lot of thanks oh, that's um oh question from Ronald Pyle who worked with Henry at the Roth uh at oh, no. No. <laughs> he says if whatever happens is always okay do you smash things up sometimes I do sometimes yes I do, do. You? <laughs> I do, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I do. Some things, um, it's usually the ones that um, don't work are the ones that often where I'm maybe feeling a bit less courageous or a bit more tentative, which can happen if, if I don't watch my energy levels, really. Um, if I, um, or if I start to get a bit cautious or... Um, those are the ones that I might think, oh, that hasn't sort of, um, um, 
but I don't, I do break up some, but not nowhere near as much as you might think, and certainly not as much as a lot of other potters do who have mountains of shards behind their studios, quite a lot of them. No, I, I don't, um, I don't. Um, no, but I sometimes just it's just a necessary right. part of it. <laughs> I mean, I think how giving myself permission to do that is a great liberator, actually. If I say to myself, it's okay if it fails, then so I give myself permission that if it, if it, if it doesn't work, it's okay, I'll, I'll break it up and make another one. I can easily make, I can make loads more, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, it does help to, to, um, to liberate, um, but I don't actually take advantage of it very often. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, a question from Shirley. Uh, are your colours mostly in your glazes or are they in the slips? They're, no, no, they're not slips. They are glazes. The yeah. only slip that I use is a, is a white slip, um, which I put over the clay because the clay isn't, doesn't fire white. The clay fires a sort of oatmeal biscuity colour or uh -huh. sculptures. And on the, on, the, on the functional pieces, the clay that I use for functional pieces fires a sort of pale grey. And so I cover everything with the, with the white slip. And then on top of that, um, um, it's, it's, they're all colored glazes. Basically, effectively, I have got one base glaze, one transparent glaze, which I use as a base for all the colored glazes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the color, the fact that they're within a glaze, what I, I did start off by using slips, you know, many, many years ago when I was still starting out, I did, and what I found with slips is that they are opaque, and they are, they tend to be sort of matte and um, um, and opaque. And um, whereas um, using glazes rather than slips, coloured glazes, they because they're translucent, the colour is translucent. It has much much greater depth, like you know, like the sea does, like the ocean. Mm -hmm. So you can you can look into it, and it, it can um, um, it's got a much more um, richer palette and it shows the nuances of the differences in color as well the variations in particularly cobalt and, and copper as well so responsive to the nuances of whether it's um thick or thin so yeah so i use a, a transparent glaze as the as the medium for the colored glazes oh, and, and some amazing results from that mm. um i think we've got time for just maybe another couple uh, let's see. Uh, Claire's asking if you've made the necklace that you're wearing, and if that's something oh. that you. Yes, thank you, Claire. Yes, I did. Is yes. that in a new venture or just a one-off? Well, no, it's something I do sometimes because I've got a a, a, a granddaughter uh, and who comes into the studio sometimes. So it was to play with her really one day, and oh. we, let's make some beads. And I thought, well, this is fun. So yeah, <laughs> I, I made oh, some. Beautiful. I've made some bangles. I've made a, uh, a ceramic with some porcelain bangles. And uh, I thought, well, they're porcelain, you know, they're, you know, they're going to be quite. But actually, I have carried, uh, worn that porcelain bangle all the way around Australia when I was doing a lecture and a tour of uh, Australia. And, and I've still, you know, it's fine. It's, you know, they, they're yeah. very robust, survive well. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think the final question, which is something that I'm very interested in, and I think when I was doing my research, speaking to yourself and a few other makers as well who are very painterly like Gordon Baldwin. Um, do you consider yourself a potter, an artist, a ceramic artist, a sculpture, or do you, ref I have a feeling you may refuse all label. <laughs> no, I'll say yes to any of them. I'll say yes, yes to all of them. <laughs> yeah, yes, I am a potter. Yes, I'm an artist. Yes, I'm a sculptor. Yes, I'm a painter. Yes, I'm a ceramic artist. But, you know, actually, you know, I started in clay. I'm a, I started with making pots. You know, that's really the foundation. Without that, nothing else happened. That's the foundation. It's my roots. It's where I, I come from. It's where I, I always um, come back to. So mm -hmm. you know, that's why, you know, those cups and saucers that I showed you the china the cups and saucers made of china clay you know i was making a big sculpture one day and cups and saucers the next day and i quite yeah. like you know um going so, back pot, yeah i think of myself as a, a potter really who does all these other things as well no that's wonderful um and there's just one little thank you from a marsha carp which i think i should oh. mention to say that she's been using her tableware of yours for over 15 years yeah. so thank you yeah thank you marsha <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? 
Thank you very much. And thank you all for your questions and for being so engaged in the process and understand this is a very different way of doing things. And if we were in the Shipley, um, we'd be talking for a very, very long time, I'm sure. Um, but we must uh, have to leave it there, I'm afraid, but thank you everyone. So what I would like to do now is to introduce Liz Rothschild, who will share with us the exciting news about this year's recipient of the Henry Rothschild bursary. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Janine. And thank you, Sandy, for an absolutely fantastic talk. Be beautiful. Um, so I'm very delighted to announce the winner of this year's Henry Rothschild bursary. We had some really excellent proposals from a wide variety of artists working with clay, and it was extremely hard arriving at our final decision. However, this year's winner showed a breadth, timeliness, and originality in her approach that impressed the panel very much. And she is Mella Shaw. So Mella's background, yes, we could give her a round of applause and there she is, <laughs> except it'll be a fairly silent round because everybody's beautifully got unmuted. So welcome Mella. And uh, Mella's background is in anthropology. She came to ceramics as a second career after working in museums and galleries for 15 years. She's drawn to the way objects can be imbued with shared cultural meaning. She has a passion for the limitless potential of clay as a material, which she discovered as a mature student when studying for a ceramics diploma at City Lit in London. She graduated with a master's in ceramics and glass from the Royal College of Art London in 2013. Mella's practice is very broad and ideas driven. She makes thought provoking objects and site specific installations around environmental themes of balance, tipping point, fragility and loss. She uses many different methods of making to communicate her ideas, including throwing, hand building, slip casting, smoke firing. She now combines her practice with teaching and writing about ceramics. So now let me hand over to Mella in Edinburgh to tell us a little bit about what she plans to do with the bursary. Um, thank you very much, Liz. Can you hear me, everyone? I'm working. Great. Um, I just wanted to quickly just say how amazing that talk was, Sandy. Thank you so much. I know everyone will be wanting to say this, but I get to speak right now. So it was just so incredibly joyous and to see that creative confidence is just so inspiring. So yeah, thanks. Um, and thank you, Liz, as well, for introducing me um, and also for the rest to the rest of the panel for um, selecting me for the bursary. Um, obviously, I'm really honoured and I'm really excited to get started as well. Um, so this bursary is an invaluable opportunity for me really to develop my practice and push a project forward that I've been really wanting to do for a while, but um, wouldn't have been able to do without the bursary. So it's fantastic. Um, as Liz says, uh, said, I... Uh, my, I often play with balance and tipping forms and thresholds in my practice. And over the last five years, that's led me to make work that's sort of consciousness raising and is connected to environmental tipping points, I suppose. Um, I think for like a lot of makers and maybe particularly ceramicists, I'm very aware of the carbon footprint of my practice and also the need to be conscious about the use of resources. Uh, I think a lot of us feel that way. So my idea is to delegate to develop a range of work that I'm calling rare earth, um, which highlights on the rapidly depleting mineral reserves. In particular, I'm gonna focus on the enormous amount of electronic waste that is being generated in the culture that we have that um, is based on inbuilt obsolescence, I suppose. So um, I was amazed uh, to learn that there's only about 12 years left of the um, mineral indium which is used to make touch screens touch sensitive. Uh, and also that we're at this point where there's so much precious metal thrown away in, um, in e-waste. So things like circuit boards for mobile phones and computers that soon will actually be more advantageous to mine landfill than to um, try to extract virgin minerals and metals. So for this project, I want to, uh, I'm gonna be using gold as a symbol for value and I will be experimenting with making my very own gold luster, but I'm going to make it from gold that's been salvaged directly from e-waste, electronic waste. 
And I'll also incorporate this into sculptural ceramic pieces um, that reference up the up to 60 different minerals that are used uh, in smartphone production. Um, so this new body of work is quite ambitious and I'm just really happy to have received the funding because there's a lot of experimentation that I need to do and I'm really looking forward to sort of getting started. I'm sure there's quite a lot of ceramicists um, tuned in right now so if anyone has any experience in making their own gold luster I'd really love to hear from you. Um, um, my name's Mala Shaw so you can find me on my website and contact me if you want to share your experience with that. Um, but yeah I really just wanted to thank the panel again for letting me um, have this amazing honour of having the Henry Rothschilds Memorial Bursary and I'm really looking forward to sharing with some of you the things that I make. Great, thank you Mala. Thank you. Thank you, Mel, and congratulations. And I'm sure we all look forward to seeing what work develops from, uh, from the bursary. And thank you very much, Liz, for joining us this evening. Um, so thank you again, Sandy, for your brilliant talk. And thanks everybody for signing up and joining in. As been said before, it's just so important to be able to keep these conversations going in times where we can't all physically be together. Um, the details of the talk, it will be shared online. It will be... Um, uh, go online if you wish to revisit the talk um, and, and make reference there. So thank you again um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. And hopefully next year, we'll be able to enjoy the lecture in the beautiful Shipley Art Gallery. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.